Sup Freaks, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at River. River has a new referral program. Go to river.com slash TFTC for $5 worth of Bitcoin. When you sign up, set up an account and buy $100, you're going to get $5 of Bitcoin on top of that. River is the most secure Bitcoin exchange since they don't rely on any third parties. They built everything in-house from their wallets to their Lightning Network wallets. They also have zero fee, dollar cost averaging. Other platforms charge large fees and have giant spreads. Go with River to avoid that. If you set up your DCA, again, you're not going to pay any fees on those buys. River also has a relationship management team that's US-based and available by phone for you or your business. You can actually call River to get some customer support. It's a great value add that is hard to find these days. And again, they build everything in-house, including their cold storage. And all Bitcoin is held one-to-one in their multi-sig cold storage wallets but they encourage self-custody as Bitcoiners. So the goal is to get you Bitcoin and to get it off of River into a wallet that you control. They build everything in-house. It's the most secure exchange. They've got free dollar cost averaging and they have the new referral program. So go to river.com slash TFTC, sign up and you'll get $5 worth of Bitcoin after you buy $100. Enjoy this rip. Yeah, Dave is, uh, like I said, I view him as an adopted grandfather. He, He doesn't know that. But that's how I view him. He's a smart guy. Yeah. It's uh, So what, what were you guys chatting about on your show? Oh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, he started, uh, we we're trying to talk about climate, but we uh, spent only a small percentage of it on climate. So he touched on a lot of other stuff on uh, politics, presidential politics and uh, COVID and all sorts of things. Yeah, I just saw he tweeted out that he thought he was done writing about climate, but he just wrote 20 pages for his, for his year in review blog post. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff he wrote in 2019 about uh, climate was really good. He must have spent a lot of time on it. It was very good content. Yeah. I think the, the most prescient anecdote he used, uh, in 2019, it was like after a hurricane had happened somewhere in the Caribbean, the coral reef came back rather quickly. They found out it was because people stopped swimming in the ocean with sunscreen on. That's what was killing the reefs. Interesting. Yeah, Peter Red was on my podcast, and he was talking about similar stuff about uh, the Great Barrier Reef down there. That CO2, it, of course, doesn't do anything bad to the Barrier Reef, but sunscreen does. And he was he's the most respected climate scientist in Australia. He got fired from the university, correct? He did. I think from J- James Cook, there was a whole uh, big stink about that, uh, that uh, he got a crowdfunded defense, I think. And I think he eventually ended up winning part of it, at least. But uh, it was just crazy that he got in trouble for saying true things about uh, what was happening down there. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. And so I guess that's why it's very interesting to get you back at this particular point in time. Last we spoke was about 18 months ago, April of last year almost 19 months now at this point. It's 50 degrees here in Austin, Texas, unseasonably cold. I saw you tweeted out earlier today um, that it's unseasonably cold where you are. There's snow on the ground and there was a record high of something like 68 in the 50s. Yeah, or something. yeah I looked it up. The, the record high here on that date is 83, degree, 83, 83 Fahrenheit in 1950. And today the high is supposed to be 37. There's snow on the ground. So the whole narrative is it's getting warmer and warmer every year and, uh, you know, it's accelerating, but it absolutely is not. You know. But did you see the hurricane that hit Acapulco? Um, we're getting crazy storms now. Yeah, I did not follow that. It's happening right now? And it happened last week. Okay. Um, yeah. What you're trying to say. No, we're getting crazier hurricanes because the ocean's getting warmer. Mm. Yeah, and again, the data doesn't support that at all. I don't know if you follow Joe Bastardi at all. He's my number one guy, I think, for U.S. hurricanes. He's constantly talking about, he has great knowledge of what happened in the past. He keeps saying in the 1950s, it was horrendous. There were so many major hurricanes that hit the U.S. in the 1950s. We haven't seen anything like that since then. Nobody really knows why the 1950s were so bad, but it it wasn't CO2 then, and it's not now, of course. No, and I think think Dave dove into this, too. A lot of the fear-mongering around hurricanes, particularly, is because they do a lot of economic damage these days and people are not able to connect that fact with the fact that we've just built so much real estate in these areas that are prone to get hit by hurricanes. 
Right. That's the whole deal that if a hurricane hit the east coast of the U.S. in the 1700s, it did not do very much damage. But now there's, of course, there's so much valuable real estate in the way that it's going to do a, a lot of damage. But that Galveston hurricane in what, 1900 was absolutely terrible. It's still the most deadly hurricane hit the U.S. ever in terms of people killed. And of course, yeah. that was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. And the island that I visit in the summers in South Jersey, it had a whole city block east closer to the ocean. I believe it was like the 1960s. It got hit by a hurricane and wiped out the block. But um, we do have flooding on the island these days, but I'm convinced it's because they built so many goddamn houses and tore down all the trees so there's nothing to absorb the water on the island anymore. Okay. Yeah, I can believe that. There's a lot of different factors. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where do you think we stand right now in the context of the climate debate since we last spoke? The world has experienced I a, a crazy energy crisis. Uh, we have a lot bigger things to worry about in the world, and it seems like the climate narrative is falling to the back burner right now. Are you seeing that too? That That is what I'm seeing. I mean, I've been following it pretty much every day for like 17 years now, so maybe I'm a little too close to it. But it really does seem like that uh, the climate realists are uh, gaining traction. It really does. And I've talked to a lot of people, even since I talked to you last, who have said that clearly uh, they've been lying to us uh, in the last three or four years with the, uh, the the COVID narrative. And then they're saying, what else are they lying to us about? Uh, a lot of people, I think, are uh, thinking along those lines. I think that's a pretty big deal. Do you think it's mainly driven by that drive to question due to people seeing fuckery, for lack of a better term, in other areas of their life and applying it to this too, if they're lying to the about this, probably lying about this as well. Or do you think the efforts of the climate realists like yourself and others, Dave Collum, that have really been beating the drum of getting better data out there and a different framework from approaching this subject is having any effect? Yeah, I, I do, of course, think it's a combination, but I do think a big part of it is what I mentioned is that people on their own and they're, they're seeing lies and they're finding, they're starting to question everything. That's for sure happened to me as of, uh, what, 20 years ago, I kind of uh, was fat and happy and believed what people were telling us about all sorts of stuff. When I look back at that now, I, I just can't believe how naive I was. But I think a lot of people now are doing this, are having a similar experience where they're looking back at themselves and they couldn't believe how trusting they were. I think there's way less trust. And I think that's very, I think it's a good thing that people are not trusting these ridiculous narratives. So many of them are complete baloney. Yeah. And it, I mean, across the board, whether it's COVID, Look at yes. the financial situation here in the U.S. You look at how much debt the government's printing. I just saw a stat. They printed $1.7 trillion in Q3 of this year. And Janet Yellen came out this week and said, oh, we're actually going to print at least $850 billion in Q1 of next year. Uh, you have another war in the Middle East popping up, and people uh, are understandably fatigued from the 20-year war in the Middle East that, that happened in the beginning of the century. Uh number of things include climate people are we're sitting here in texas it's very cold today uh it was a very hot summer we'll give we'll give you that but um it doesn't seem like anything's really adding up across the board yeah yeah so i I don't know where we're going from here in terms of uh i, I don't know what like the medical community what are they going to do to win back our trust uh, i don't know uh, <laughs> pfizer's financials came out today i think they're their revenue was down multi-billion dollars year on year from this time last year to to Q, end of Q3 this year. And Ed Dowd's been doing a lot of good work, really highlighting uh, the increased cost in the insurance industry that the adverse effects of the vaccine is having there. Like the insurance industry is pretty worried right now. Yeah, it's uh, how many sigmas. He keeps tweeting about how many sigmas off of reality the data is or off of what it should be. It's uh, mind-blowing. It's scary. Yeah. And so where do you think it goes from here? Do you think we get retribution for what I would deem a crime against humanity that I played out over the last three years? I kind of think so. I think lawyers are going to get involved. I think they're going to smell a lot of money in the water, and I think they are going to get involved. And I think retribution will happen, but... I don't know. We'll mm. see. If it does, what do you think that means on the back end of this? Like, it does feel like we're 
in the middle of, I uh, hate to use the term because QA non ran with it, but the great awakening people really beginning to understand that things are systemically broken across the board and desperately yeah. need to be fixed. I think it's happening. I don't know. I mean, you've had Ed Dowd on a few times. I've listened to uh, tens of hours probably of what he's said. And he's talking about how maybe bad times are ahead, but uh, better times are on the other side of this. I think people are waking up. I I'm seeing it as I'm just talking to random people in my uh, personal life that uh, I I'm hearing questions now that I was not hearing at all five years ago. So <laughs> what are this, I think it's happening. What are those questions like? <laughs> just what else are they lying to us about? Yeah. Yeah. Not well, with everybody. I, I see some people that are still swallowing every single thing they see, uh, whatever the TV tells them. Some people are still, well, I can't believe they still are, but some are, are but uh, a lot of them aren't. A lot of them aren't buying it. Yeah, it's funny when you tune out the the media and then you're just so happy to catch it. So last night was a perfect example of that for me. I was writing and had the World Series on in the background. Uh, watching the Rangers Diamondbacks game and the game ended. I was still writing and I just lost track of what was going on behind me. The local news came on after <laughs> and I just peeked my head up for like five minutes and it was, st it was just like death, despair, death, despair, death, despair. It's like this, this propaganda just spitting through my TV. I was like, how the hell do people watch this day in and day out? Yeah, I, I don't watch that. I don't know how they do. Um, one thing that gives me hope is uh, what Ivar Cummins, he talks about the take-up of the V. He doesn't use the whole word for YouTube purposes. Mm -hmm. But there was a time not that long ago where the uh, take-up was absolutely huge, 70% uh, plus, and now the number is more like 3%. I'm seeing a lot of that. That, that. that number itself gives me hope that people are waking up. I don't know if you're seeing that too. Yeah, the latest booster. Uh, yeah. It's only got like a 2% uptick here in the U.S. I mean, people, yeah. they, they were set, they were... I mean, when you think about it, the V was sold as safe and effective. You're going to need yeah. to get two installments of it and then prove not to be safe and effective. And well, actually, you need to get an installment every six months, maybe every six weeks, depending on your your health outlook and your age. Uh, and again, that was like an overt lie that yeah. that was spread pretty aggressively via the propaganda arms. But on social media, people were so proud that they just had the V and they were constantly posting pictures. Look, I just had the V. And then like the NBA was talking about it all the time, the NBA media, that it's so important. Look, each team is taking the V. But now, nothing. I, I don't hear it mentioned at all. In no, terms Pfizer. of like the, yeah. I was going to say Pfizer threw a last ditch effort out there, signed Jason Kelsey, or not Jason, Travis Kelsey, to that big endorsement deal. Try and get people to say, hey, the football player's getting it. Maybe I should too. Yeah, and Aaron Rodgers is mocking him openly, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which he should. Yeah. And then you had an interesting, you sent me um, a tweet. You were at the Berkshire Hathaway uh, investor meeting and asked a question. I did, yeah. I asked Charlie Munger about that because Charlie Munger came up very strongly and said the, the people who didn't take the V were, I, I think he said, quote, stupid. He had a, a very strong quote. So I asked him about that at the meeting. And I said, do you still stand behind those quotes? And he just said, yeah, sure. That was his entire answer. And uh, I, I should have asked him why he, he was still standing behind that. But I think that is uh, probably the worst take of his career. And I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's so important that he took that stand and he totally blew that one. Uh, I really held him up as kind of the model of the rational thinker. He's got this whole speech about the 24 causes of human misjudgment. So I really thought he was maybe the... Uh, uh, the model of a human judgment. And he, uh, he's no longer that model for me. Now I, I don't respect the guy anymore. No, he, what's he, is he like 96 now? How? He's almost 100. I think he's not quite 100. Yeah. So maybe I should give him a break, but I don't. Yeah. No, you can't give him a break, but you got to yeah. think, dude, it's just set in his ways. You know, think about like Berkshire Hathaway. I imagine they benefited massively from the COVID lockdowns and taking advantage of the volatility in the markets, whether it be in stocks or real estate. When you go back and you look at everything they've invested in, whether it's like Coke, Walmart, like all these companies that have made the country extremely unhealthy. Um, insurance company is probably their best play. Um, low risk, good, good returns. Maybe that may not be the case. Maybe he's going to regret uh incentivizing people to get the jab um, if the insurance companies begin to have problems because of all the payouts they um, they have to endure in the coming years. But 
No, I, I mean, think. Go ahead. It, it could hit Berkshire. I mean, they're heavily into the reinsurance business. I don't know if, uh, if the V causes enough problems if it could hit Berkshire's bottom line somehow. But it does make me wonder, uh, uh, where does a guy of that age right now, where does he get his news and information? Does he have any idea who Edward Dowd is? Or is he just, I, I don't know where. You know, he's not listening to podcasts probably. He's not on Twitter. I would love to know. I, I think the uh, information he's working from is vastly different now than the information you and I are working from. I would love to know. Yeah, and there's definitely an asymmetry there. I imagine he's one of those people who gets documents from the Bloomberg terminal printed out and put on his desk every morning, just reads them. I, I looked around. I, there was a, some story saying that uh, maybe a, quite some time ago he had a computer, but he never plugged it in. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Uh, but, uh, it's a different world. It really is. Yeah, It's exciting. It's a double-edged sword. It's, it's uh, extremely unnerving. In some regards, you can see all the bad shit in the world in real time on the Twitter feed, but it also gives you the ability to get the good information, find the Ed Dowds, find the Tom Nelsons, find the Dave Columns that are putting signal out there. And I guess that's the big predicament we find ourselves in as a society that's transitioning in the digital age is developing the ability to filter the most information we've ever consumed as a species uh, in quick burst and discern the the signal from the noise. Yeah, that that makes me think about Chat GPT. I don't know if you've uh, been using it a lot, but I've been testing it out a lot, and I'm finding that for a lot of things, it really is a, a great resource. But I'm constantly testing it and with something that I know, like climate change, and for that, I just give it a straight up, uh, almost a straight up F. It's just terrible. It's just uh, you know, it's like you're watching CNN for a lot of the climate change questions I ask. <laughs> Yeah, we actually recorded a podcast on the subject yesterday uh, with a Bitcoiner who's creating his own large language model because he was using chat GBT uh, and asking it simple questions like, is inflation good for the economy? And it was returning like Keynesian brain rot think. Like, yes, inflation means that you have a healthy economy if it's contained to a 2% level. Um, and he basically explained that he fell down the rabbit hole of artificial intelligence, how these models are created, the data that's fed to them, the the weighting that's put on certain amounts of data. And you came to the conclusion that these are essentially propaganda tools that um, are highly dependent on the context given to them by the people who build the models. And so that's what worries me about the AI thing. You have OpenAI, Zuckerberg, Anthropic, all going to Capitol Hill and saying, you need to regulate this industry and only let us create yes. these tools, which... Um, it could be a strong tool to basically dictate speech and very strong propaganda tools that make people believe things that simply aren't true. Did you happen to see the article that just came out saying that Kamala Harris is going to be the AI czar? Oh, yes. That, yeah. yeah. I think she already officially is the AI czar. Sure. Okay. I, I guess she has been for months, maybe. Yeah. I just found out about it. That she seems, seems well equipped for the job. <laughs> Uh, you, I, I have less faith in her than, even than you do, I think. Yeah, it's, it seems crazy. Well, it all seems crazy, especially if you look at what's going on at D.C. at the federal level. You're older than me, I think it's safe to say. Like, what, is your, <laughs> what is your perspective on where we stand at the federal level in D.C.? It seems like there's so much dysfunction. It's becoming blatantly obvious that these politicians are career politicians that don't really care about the well-being of your average American citizen at the end of the day, they really care about the special interest and the people that are feeding their campaign, uh, their campaign funding. And like, do you like, especially when you bring the debt situation into the conversation, I'm pretty convinced that we're reaching the end of this chapter of American politics and maybe even the political hierarchy that exists in this, this country. Yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. I, I it's kind of hard not to despair when you look at what's happening there and, and who's running the show, et cetera. I think there are a few uh, bright lights there. Like uh, the new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson, he has some quotes about climate that sounds actually sane. So I, I'm glad to hear that. There's Ron Johnson from Wisconsin. He also, uh, and uh, Thomas Massey. There, there's some people in the climate world, are, that are saying sane things against this ridiculous narrative. So uh, there, there's some hope. 
but uh, those bright lights are few and far between. So I don't know what's what's going to happen next. No, we still got the Inflation Reduction Act to deal with. That was brought into the conversation and signed into law between now and the last time we spoke. What are your thoughts on the IRA? Yeah, it just sounds just crazy. So much spending, so much completely crazy spending to make our electrical grid worse. Clearly, uh, putting all that wind and solar onto the grid is going to cost enormous amounts of money and it's going to make uh, our grid way worse. So it's just terrible. And I, I'm hoping maybe they can't get the money spent before we can get somebody else in office. I, I asked somebody else about that on my podcast. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight into that, whether we're really going to blow all this money, uh, which we don't have, uh, and uh, wreck our grid. I, I hope it doesn't happen, but I don't know. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Tom, but... Uh... The government has proven that they are more than willing to spend money we don't have, drive us further into debt, uh, to do crazy things like invest in a grid system built on wind and solar a decade before they plan to blot out the sun um, to, to control the climate. Yeah, and they're going to try to run all the cars in California on electricity. And uh, plus, uh, they're asking them not to plug the cars in now because they don't have enough electricity. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to be talking to uh, Brian Gitt, I think, later today. I think you just had, you've had him on your podcast. I think he's going to elaborate on just how crazy it is. And uh, uh, I don't know. we got to get some sane people in office fast. We really do. Brian may be a good candidate, too, because I think what he and the team at Oak Low are doing is very important. The idea of small modular reactors. I'm not sure what you think about nuclear at this particular point in time but I, th I think that makes the most sense to me at least is like if we need stable base load nuclear has proven to be the most stable most energy dense most reliable and there's a lot of bad propaganda around the safety of nuclear specifically yeah i think i've had close to maybe 10 people on my podcast since we talked last uh, talking in great detail about nuclear power and yeah i'm a, I'm a big fan i think there's uh uh, I think it is the way we're going to be powering our civilization uh, later on. And uh, even right now, um, I think I would like to see us uh, really go uh, uh, put up a lot of those plants right now. There's a guy named Cal Abel, totally brilliant, that uh, talked about mm -hmm. it on my podcast. Yeah. Hey, he's a Bitcoiner, right? I, I don't know for sure. He must be. But I think I, he I is, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Cal's been around uh, pumping the the uh, the nuclear drum within Bitcoin for a while. And he's also got a really interesting... Um, sort of price model based off the amount of electricity dedicated to the Bitcoin network oh. as well. Yeah, um, I mean, he's he's one of those guys who was a straight up genius. It sure, he strikes me as a genius, no question. Yeah, And he was like in the Navy working on the warships, correct? On subs, yeah. I think he was in the subs for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it feels like... Uh, I, I don't want to, I so uh, I'm a bit apprehensive right now because uh, about a year and a half ago, I called um, Pete Clown World, middle of summer 2021, almost two, more than two years ago now. Um, and that proved to be a, a terrible prediction. Clown World's only accelerated, gone to levels I did not think were possible um, since then. But I do want to say, like, it, it does feel like the, the climate narrative, again, because people are experiencing uh, what life is like with unreliable electricity and power systems uh, that they're sort of throwing the the whole climate narrative out the window and saying, I don't care. I just need my lights to turn on. I need gas in my car at an affordable rate. Uh, I need to be warm in the, in the winter. And then you juxtapose that with the insanity of the people uh, running the just stop oil terrorist campaign and cementing themselves to, the streets and throwing oil on uh, fine art and it, it seems like it's all right there like alright this is objectively insane what these just stop oil people are doing and it seems like everything the climate hysterics are doing to, to fix the problem is just making my life worse so maybe Maybe I shouldn't care about the climate problem that much. Yeah, I don't think they're winning any hearts and minds at all. I mean, I'm loving seeing constantly these videos of these people sitting on the road and then people who are trying to get to work are just grabbing them physically, dragging them off the road. I, I enjoy seeing that because it's the right thing to do. People, people do need to get to work. So that's a good sign. Another good sign is that like Joe Rogan uh, with his huge pull, 
he, he seemed kind of in on the climate narrative a few years ago. And then he just had a podcast with Alex Berenson. They weren't talking about climate, but a couple times within the podcast it came up and they both kind of scoffed at it. I think it's a pretty big deal that these guys are starting to scoff at it, which they should. That, that, that gives me hope. Yeah. You got to scoff at it. Subjectively yeah. insane. And it, I'm actually writing an article about it for the Bitcoin times, but ESG too. I think that's another thing playing into our favor is the whole ESG narrative is completely crumbled, particularly due to the fact that the ESG funds that were marketed as something that was going to get you great return and you're going to be helping the environment and social justice and corporate governance structures around the world. They've performed absolutely terribly. Yeah, I'm just looking up here. It's Larry Fink, right? The BlackRock guy yes, said he yeah. doesn't want to say ESG anymore. I think that's a big point in our favor that uh, it's becoming so poisoned or people are realizing that it's crazy. So he doesn't even want to say it anymore. And it seems like he's going to try to still push it through and use some other name. But then we're going to figure that out, that name out, and he won't use that name anymore. I, that uh, also gives me hope. There's a lot of hope out there. Yeah, equitable capital is probably what they'll call it next. But no, it is. <laughs> I think I think at this particular juncture too, within Bitcoin, we notice this very acutely, which is voting harder is not going to solve your problem. Uh, and so, instead of depending on the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the executive branch to push through a bill to end the Federal Reserve, that's likely uh, never going to happen. Um, so we have this beautiful open source distributed peer to peer digital cash system in Bitcoin where we can build the alternative to the federal reserve on top of the Bitcoin protocol. And hopefully what I do hope, particularly in climate energy, that's actually what I'm writing this piece is I think the Bitcoin mining industry is proving this uh, pretty well too. Like stop waiting on the politicians to change policy, to get what you want. Just go do it. Yeah. I'm hoping, I don't know if you're seeing in the Bitcoin mining world, if people are uh, trying to uh, say CO2 is a pollutant, but we're not emitting much CO2 and we're we're not uh, doing, we're not really terrible. I hope people are just straight up pushing back against the narrative and saying CO2 is good. I don't know if you're seeing any of that, but they, I'd like to see that. I've been pushing that. Steve Barber from Upstream Data, uh, instead of telling people to learn to code, he's been telling them to learn to coal um, because we need to feed the plants more CO2. And uh, coal produces a lot of good CO2 for the plants. Good. Um, but no, there's definitely a bifurcation within the industry, particularly between the publicly traded Bitcoin miners who are still trying to LARP to those, um, those capital allocators that give them money, uh, that they're good for the environment, they're reducing CO2. And actually, I, th I think there's a big part of the industry that's making a massive mistake, um, particularly here in Texas. And we've seen the ramifications of this over the last few years, which is they're saying, hey, we're good because we're going to help you uh, build out wind and solar capacity. Like you can use us to um, go do that. And we create the economic incentives for the build out of more wind and solar. And that has had detrimental effects on Texas's grid. Yeah, that's a terrible thing. I'd like to see no more new wind and solar or just maybe in certain little spots it might be uh, might be worthwhile. But like I'm from up here in Minnesota and there's they're trying to put in a huge solar facility up there way above the 45th uh, latitude and it makes zero sense. It's just they're covering good farmland with uh, with these panels. So I would love to see uh, the locals are fighting it. I hope they win. It's it's terrible. What is covering that much farmland? Like what is the opportunity cost of using that for solar generation as opposed to agrarian productivity? Yeah, that's the thing that those plants are taking in uh, sunlight and they're converting it uh, eventually into food. And that makes sense. But uh, in Minnesota, uh, you know, with that low sun angle and everything, it, it makes zero sense. And for a good portion of the winter, they're going to be sitting there covered with snow doing nothing. And uh, I don't know how long they're going to last. There's just so many drawbacks that and of course, nobody would do it unless it was subsidized. Of course. So, yeah. Yeah. How, how much is subsidies driving this? I think it's all subsidies. I mean, Buffett said that about wind power, right? That he, Berkshire Hathaway puts up so many uh, tur turbines, and he said straight up that we wouldn't do it except for the uh, the tax uh, the tax advantages that people wouldn't do it otherwise because it doesn't make any sense. Can you describe the tax advantages for the people who may be unaware? 
I don't know them in, in detail. It's it's the subsidies. I should look up the actual Buffett quote, but uh, I keep tweeting out that Buffett quote that we wouldn't do it except for the tax advantages. I don't know. The yeah. Yeah, I've heard something. I don't know if it was Australia, the U.S., or somewhere else, but um, farmland that gets wind farms, the, the value of the property goes up like 10 or 20x because each windmill produces something like $600,000 a year, just pure right. subsidy revenue. And it gets paid to, yeah. to get spun up. Yeah, I think just all sorts of shady stuff are happening. That I think some of that wind power might be sold more than once. I don't know if there's everybody's checking to make sure that, that nothing funny is going on. Uh, I don't trust any of the accounting. None of it makes any sense. I think it's all a ripoff. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna try and do it, though. They're going to try and do it. They're going to try and completely force us to a, sol a grid on wind and solar. And that's... Uh, particularly with the Inflation Reduction Act, which, again, to your chagrin, they're probably going to find the money to do it just by issuing new treasuries or just printing money out of nowhere. And what do you think individuals can do to fight back against this insanity? Well, there is a guy who was on my podcast named John Droz, and he is a super smart guy. He really knows how to uh, go in locally and help the locals fight a uh, wind facility that's being put up in their area. And I think there's a lot of successful local pushback. I think Robert Bryce has a section on his website about people fighting back successfully against this stuff. I think that local pushback is, is really huge. I've heard uh, people in the UK also are having big success in fighting this stuff on a local level. Yeah, actually going back to the island I visited in the summer in South Jersey, there was a big campaign to get a wind farm off the coast. They started building it, started killing a bunch of whales and dolphins, throwing out their sonar, uh, their internal sonar detectors. And like you had a crazy amount of whales and dolphins beaching on the shores of South Jersey. And every day that you drove in on the, uh, the overpass onto the island, there's a big sign like, stop the wind farms. Um, but it's hilarious too, because uh, a lot of the people that LARP about it are typically like Northeast champagne liberals, champagne limousine liberals that will sort of advocate for this publicly. But then when it comes to their neighborhood and they have to look at the wind farms disrupting their, their horizon view, they say, wait a second, no, I don't want this here. Yeah. I think another thing that people are going to see is that the, uh, the wind facilities they put up not that long ago are going to need replacement. That. I, the narrative is you put them up and you get free power for many decades, but it might be more like 10 or 15 years before you got to replace them. And of course you can't recycle them. And I think it's uh, maybe Robert Bryce again has uh, photos of, uh, they just are putting up uh, the, uh, these used blades and they're just bulldozing them over in a landfill. That, that's where they're going. So the blades are up there maybe 10 or 15 years, then off to the landfill. And how sustainable is that? I think those visuals help people to uh, fight back against it too. How sustainable is it? And then, how environmentally friendly is it? Just burying toxic windmill blades into the ground and letting that seep into the topsoil. Yeah, not at all. People don't think about any of this stuff. That I mean, there, there was this narrative that the climate crisis is so important. The fake climate crisis is we don't can't worry our pretty, pretty little heads about any of this stuff. Let's we got to do whatever. Let's not even think about it. Let's do it. But I think now people are thinking about it more. That that makes me happy. Agreed. So you started a podcast since we last spoke too. What's that been like? I, I've really enjoyed it. I've done maybe, uh, I've done over 160 podcasts since we talked last and it's been a total blast. I've learned so much and I've had so many smart people, a tons of people who've been on my podcast. I had never heard of them before. There's a lot of people that are just kind of working on their own. I just had a guy uh, yesterday named Mike Wallace. Hadn't heard about him. He's done brilliant work on solar influence on, uh, on the climate itself uh, in great detail. So it's, it's really fascinating. There's so many rabbit holes you can go down. And this whole idea that uh, CO2 is the climate control knob and just the third grader can understand it because it's so simple. It's just complete, that's a complete crock. It's incredibly complex, as you know. So the whole idea of trying to model it is ridiculous. But it, it's fun listening to all these people talking in great detail about what they've found out and trying to understand how does it really work. It's, it's great. Yeah, I'm not sure if you tweeted this out, but I saw the other day that there was a, I don't know if it was a research paper or some scientist was just tweeting something he had found, but the 
there's the potential that the causality has been completely backwards where people are trying to say the increase in CO2 is, is causing higher temperatures. And then the scientists came out and said, well, no, actually it's like higher temperatures are adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, I've seen that a lot and that may well be true right? because uh, yeah, as the earth warms up, then the oceans can't hold as much CO2. So uh, it's the cause and effect, this, this whole, whatever, $40 trillion scam may be based on cause and effect being uh, screwed up. You know? Yeah. What do you think the, the cost, the opportunity cost digging into that of focusing on this issue and allocating all this money towards this? What are we missing out on by focusing so much energy, time, mental bandwidth and money on this particular problem that may not be a problem at all? I mean, potentially it could destroy Western civilization. It, it actually <laughs> could. It, it sounds crazy, but it could. It, it, we, we don't have 40 trillion to spend on this and to uh, wreck our grid and be out 40 trillion dollars is uh, could destroy our civilization. Um, we, people in Minnesota where I live, if we actually tried to power Minnesota for one year on wind and solar power, if we really did that, lots of people would die. For sure, lots of people would die. Um, the only reason that's not going to happen is that uh, there are some there's some sanity here, and we are still going to use other forms of energy. But anyway, uh, potentially it, it could kill enormous amounts of people. Patrick Moore is constantly saying that too. That just the fertilizers we got to have, uh, we got to have uh, hydrocarbons to uh, to have our own fertilizers, and uh, so we could die from starvation if we try to just go with organic fertilizer. So there, there's all sorts of bad things that will happen and have been happening because of this, uh, this scam and this hysteria. Yeah. And when you put it that way too, like Western civilization could collapse and it's very specific towards Western civilization. Cause you look over to China and India, they're spinning up more coal power plants and they're doing deals for natural gas with Russia at a higher pace than's ever been done before the spinning up nuclear as well. Like it seems like we're over here shooting ourselves in the foot while India and China partic particularly are spinning up all this generation that even if we do get to net zero, it's going to have a negligible effect because the amount of CO2 that they'll be pumping into the atmosphere will dwarf anything that we can mitigate on this side of the world. Yeah, I think those perspectives from other countries are really important. I don't know if you've heard of Jasper Machogu from Kenya. He's mm -hmm. been on my podcast a couple times. He's in his 20s. He's just a brilliant guy, and he's living the life of, of a small farmer, working really hard, uh, like uh, hoeing the, to uh, to uh, produce his crops. He's out there with a hoe for hours on end, and he's talking about how important it is for the uh, Africans to get uh, hydrocarbon energy and to uh, get their living standards up to to ours. And he's actually working in his village to do that. He's a really smart guy, very well informed on climate and energy. And I'm really happy to see he's getting more followers on Twitter and he's being on more podcasts. I think it's huge that um, the internet is allowing a guy like that to have a voice. He's, he's making a big difference already, I think, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. This is, again, double-edged sword of the internet. You get all the bad, but you get all the good. You get access to the good information. And yeah, like, that's a perfect example too, of like the hypocrisy. And that's part of the piece I'm writing too, is I think it's mainly the root cause of this insanity is driven by the fact that we ripped ourselves off the gold standard and completely removed opportunity cost of printing money from the market temporarily. The opportunity cost is still there. It's just hidden. Um, and the costs are finite, um, but unknowable. Um, and like we've, allowed ourselves to completely detach like thinking from reality, from how the laws of economics, the laws of physics work. Uh, we're able to print money, paper over it, throw it at problems uh, that may not exist and solutions that aren't really solutions. And then you think about like a farmer in Kenya who's looking at what we've done over the last two centuries, let's just say from the industrial to the digital age. Uh, and we get to the, the point where we have fiber optic internet, we have highways, we have massive cities. And then for some reason or another, we decide, no, you can't have that. We all need to go to zero. You cannot pull yourself up from your bootstraps. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to see Jusper. He's uh, got internet access and he's got a smartphone. 
And uh, he's out there documenting what life is like right now, where just as recently as earlier this year, uh, during the dry season, the kids in his village would have to go one or two kilometers to get water every evening. They might have to wait for two or three hours in line to get water. And it's just, uh, we take that for granted. We can just get water out of the faucet. So now the people in his village, since then, they have a well, and now the kids don't have to do that. But uh, it took a big hydrocarbon-powered truck to come in and uh, to uh, drill this well. So now uh, things are looking up there. There's all sorts of examples just in his village where hydrocarbons are making life better now even than they were one year ago. It's pretty heartwarming to see that, actually. Yeah, and I mean, Alex Epstein's done a good job of documenting this and diving particularly into this subject. It's like once you do that, like imagine the human capital that's just opened up from a simple water well being introduced to a town instead of having all these economic potential economic actors spend hours a day walking to waiting in line and filling up a, a barrel of water and walking yeah. it back to their village how much time's wasted now that they can just go to the well and get it they can spend their time actually doing productive things Yep. And he said even motorbikes, uh, just in the last few years, they got motorbikes. So before when they were done harvesting their corn, they had to carry it on their back, big, heavy loads of corn for kilometers. And now just even having motorbikes, they can uh, carry it much more quickly. And I'm sure they're going to be upgrading to trucks. And it's, of course, it's just a huge deal as time goes on. Uh, the economic impact of that is fantastic. Yeah. And going back to like this detachment from reality, it's like, it's mind blowing because I had to sit down and think about this, like energy literally is life like we would not yes. we would not be here we would not be complex organisms multi-cell organisms without the heat from the sun creating photosynthesis in this particular atmosphere that we have here on earth uh the plants don't exist the animals have nothing to eat the animals don't exist in the first place if the animals don't exist we don't have anything to eat we don't have the ability to um eat the necessary proteins for our brains to develop to uh, get to a point where we can think creatively and create tools and then harness energy to be more productive. And it is really weird that we've gotten to this point where we are neglecting arguably the most important resource we have as humans, which is energy that we can leverage to be more productive in our own lives and increase the quality of life for, for everyone. Um, it's, it's, it's society gone insane, particularly in the West for many people. Yeah, this whole idea of fighting a reliable energy is one thing, and then fighting CO2 itself as a pollutant is, is so crazy. I saw that you had Will Happer on your podcast. Mm -hmm. I think he, he's, a, of course, another really smart guy, and he's just uh, he's shaking his head at just how incredibly crazy it is that here we are in the 21st century and we're fighting CO2 as a pollutant, which is just a major a building block of our lives. Uh, I think people are going to be looking back at this, and they will not believe how crazy it got. And it's not going to stay this crazy forever. It just can't. No. What's the, what's the stat too? Like CO two only makes up something like 0.4 percent of the gases in the atmosphere. Yeah, it's 0 0.04 percent. Zero four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the whole idea. So supposedly humans have uh, increased it uh, one extra CO two molecule for every ten thousand atmospheric molecules. That's the thing that we're panicking about, one extra for every 10,000 atmospheric molecules. And I, I don't know if you've seen some videos where they ask some uh, warmest bureaucrats, how much CO2 do you think is in the air? And they'll give you numbers like 5%. They have no idea. They base their lives on the idea that this is a pollutant, and they have no idea how much CO2 is in the air. That's also astounding, I think. No, and the scary part is the propaganda has been very effective on younger generations, or particular subsections of younger generations, where these children honestly believe that the world's going to end because of climate change. Yeah, I think it's just super sad that uh, some of them are buying into it. That, And then uh, they hold up signs at these marches saying that um, you will die of old age, but I will die of climate change. Or for, <laughs> for kids to actually believe that, or, to, or little kids to lose sleep over that, that's just uh, that's child abuse, I think. It's just it's terrible. No, it's literally child abuse, psychological yeah. abuse on a mass scale. It's funny because there's like low hanging fruits of things that actually need to be taken care of. I think we'd be more energy efficient. Like I think we can both agree that um, while we don't believe climate change is a big problem or a problem at all, that the mainstream would would have you believe there are certainly inefficiencies that exist throughout the energy sector that can be made more efficient. That's 
particularly why I'm fascinated by Bitcoin mining and its role role in energy systems, whether it's mitigating gas flaring upstream or creating grid stability downstream um, within grid systems. Like there's smarter ways to attack the the energy problem. There, I think there are problems within the energy mm-hmm. sector. It's just not energy in and of itself. It's these inefficiencies that exist throughout the supply chain. Yeah, I have nothing. Uh, I think everybody's in favor of energy efficiency. I think that's something we can all agree on. But uh, yeah, th- this whole uh, fighting against CO2 or fighting against hydrocarbons, totally crazy. Yeah. So outside of uh, climate and the COVID aftermath and V rollout, what uh, what are you paying attention to these days? What's exciting you? Well, I, I wanted to bring up something that actually is related to climate here about um, something called Climate the Movie. So I don't know, uh, if you ever watched The Great Global Warming Swindle, it was done by Martin Durkin. He's a British filmmaker, tremendously uh, skilled filmmaker. And he was on my podcast. He said, you know, I'd like, really like to remake it. But now he got funding and he is remaking it. And um, I think it's going to be a really good uh, climate realist movie coming out in uh, in March. I'm actually uh, working on it with him. So th- that gives me some hope. And he did another movie called Brexit the Movie that I don't know if you've seen that. I just saw it for the first time in the last couple of weeks. But um he really does a good job of laying out uh, uh, sane arguments. I think he's uh, kind of one of us in terms of he's in favor of the working people and getting real work done. And he's against uh, the elites, the bureaucrats who are uh, kind of getting in the way of getting work done. So uh, I'm really glad that he's working on that. And uh, I can't wait to see the movie when it comes out. What are you guys particularly looking to highlight with this with this documentary? Uh, well, he is actually talking to a lot of the scientists. He's talking to uh, Will Happer, Willie Soon. He, he interviewed a lot of people. He's gonna, he even interviewed me a little bit. And so he's going to uh, have all sorts of different perspectives there. But he is going to talk about the whole issue of how this is really being used by the elites to try to control us. That's really an instrument of control. And what uh, the elites really want to do is have some sort of CBDC. And they want to be able to control our lives at a very granular level so that they can uh, turn off our access to buy groceries if they don't like what we said on social media, or uh, they only want us to fly zero or one times per year or eat so much meat. It's just a bureaucrat's dream to have this control over us. So I think he's gonna talk a lot about that in the movie, about how they're trying to use this whole scare to control us. And maybe it's not about climate, maybe it's not about uh, control. Yeah, there's definitely the control ulterior motive. Why do you think they want this much control? That's a great question. Uh, maybe it's more about uh, the money that they can get from us uh, through this control, because it's a never-ending source of money if they can uh, if they can get this control over us. Do they not have enough? <laughs> I, enough? I guess they don't. Uh, Bill Gates might not have enough. <laughs> it's a good question. It seems like he's got enough. No, it is. But, it does. Because when you put it into context, people in control. That's the other thing. Like they don't. You don't have to give them control. I believe strongly it's a mental decision. Like you can have a light switch in your head where if a critical mass of people wake up one day and say, no, like you don't have control over my life. I'm going to go spin up a natural gas power plant. I'm going to go spin up a nuclear power plant. I'm going to eat steak when I want to. I'm going to grow crops and let cattle graze. uh, And I'm not going to worry about their farts polluting the atmosphere. It's literally a decision, but it does blow my mind when you think about the small number of people across the world, whether they're part of the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, um, uh, Financial Action Task Force, the BIS, the IMF, like we're talking about probably less than 10,000 people really pushing this narrative and trying to control 8 billion people. Yeah, 10,000 unelected people, right? Ten. Unelected people. It's pretty amazing. Have you heard about Nigel Farage in the uh, UK losing mm-hmm. access to his own funds? And part of that was supposed to be because of his climate views? Yeah. That, or yeah. the whole Canadian trucker thing, of course, losing access to their funds over the, what uh, they believe politically. Pretty crazy. Yeah. And that's why we Bitcoin. That's yeah, why we that Bitcoin. is why. Yeah. What are your thoughts Actually, on Bitcoin these days? 
Well, it was completely new to me last time we talked in April of 22. But since we talked last, I mean, I've uh, been listening to the books, the Bitcoin Standard. I've been listening to tons of your podcasts, your rabbit hole recaps and stuff. Uh, I, I must have listened to tens of hours of you talking about Bitcoin since we talked last. So, yeah, I, I'm learning about it a lot. And I think uh, it's very important. Uh, yeah. I'm liking what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sly roundabout way. Today is the 15th anniversary of Satoshi dropping the white paper on the world. Uh, it's a pretty crazy thing. It's been around for 15 years, and that's uh, a lot of the v what we've been talking about today can be very uh, doomer, seen as like a doomerism, if you will. But that's, again, why I focus on Bitcoin, because I think it gives us an optimistic path out of this madness. How... You mentioned the CBDC. How are they going to control us? Mainly via the monetary system. And the CBDC will be programmed to allocate um, money to your wallet that allows you to spend it on certain things. And Bitcoin is a completely opt-in uh, distributed system that cannot be controlled by these bureaucrats and unelected officials. And I, I do think... 15 years in, we've made a lot of progress, but it's also still very early and people don't understand that. And it's going to take time to really get people onto Bitcoin and get Bitcoin to a mature state from a technological perspective to facilitate uh, economic activity at the scale that we would like to, but we're making steady progress. And I can see the light at the end of the tunnel where once we take the money out of these people's hands, Bitcoins are sly roundabout way that Hayek said we need to discover, which we did, um, they'll be rendered toothless. We can completely defang them and say, guess what? You can't print treasuries to throw at wind and solar projects. You can't print treasuries to send us to war. You can't print treasuries to give them the Pfizer to, to give us a V that has adverse, uh, adverse effects on people's health. Um, I, I do think, and that's again, why we focus on Bitcoin because I think it's the most important first sort of primitive step we need to take to take the power out of these people's hands. Yeah, I think safety makes some great points that I thought about, not at all about how if uh, the government couldn't print money then, as you mentioned, they can't send us to all these wars to spend they don't have unlimited funds. They can't print unlimited funds to spend to spend on war. So I love uh, hearing him make that point. And it, again, it's something I hadn't thought about, but that's a pretty big deal right there. That's an enormously big deal. Yeah, especially right now as we're speaking today it seems Absolutely. like they're gearing up for world war three it does and yeah it's pretty scary they're raising the the enlistment age they just raise, raise it to 42 for the air force and another part of the armed services wouldn't be surprised i mean because the military has been very publicly um had low enlistment numbers over the last few years as they've gone completely woke and uh, completely insane and you have a commander in chief who doesn't even know where he is from day to day um maybe that's like the downfall of it they, they try to draft and you get gen z in there and they're all TikToking on the battlefield and it's like what the hell is going on here so do you know who efrat fenningson is she is so. a uh, she's a journalist uh, very smart she's going to be on my podcast in a month or so and she's been reporting out of israel about how crazy it was uh, the, the whole start of this oh war. is she the ex-idf yes soldier yeah yeah she used to actually sit at that fence back in the day i think and watch the fence for uh she said if there's a cat on the other side they would find out so she's very interesting uh, interesting to listen to but I think she said, or someone has said that people as old as 60 or 61 are getting pulled into the military in Israel right now. Amazing. I mean, we saw it in Ukraine. They went all the way up to 65 for men and started pull, pulling women on the battlefield. Which is, again, going back, like it's, you have this crazy dick measuring contest between the power structure at that level, Davos class, who knows, or Russia, China. Middle East, who knows who the, the players are at that level of the hierarchy, but it's insane. Again, going back to probably less than 10,000 people making these decisions and sending hundreds of thousands, potentially millions, if we get into World War III, into the battlefield as cannon fodder for their, their dick measuring contest. So overall, though, don't you think that... Um we're succeeding in pushing back with podcasts like yours, and then you've got Rogan and like Brett Weinstein. 
I, I listen to a lot of his podcasts and he's willing to speak out, uh, even Alex Berenson, just uh, Dr. Malone. There's so many of these people, Edward Dowd. Uh, I'm really enjoying the fact that all of us now have the ability to listen to all these different perspectives that maybe Charlie Munger isn't listening to. And I think uh, the number of people who are just listening to CNN or ABC is, uh, is way down. So I think that's huge. Oh, it's dwindling. And it's very important that it's podcasting via RSS feeds too, because as we've seen with Russell Brand uh, and yeah. many others on YouTube, been completely deplatformed for saying wrong thing. I mean, we've been temporarily deplatformed from YouTube for talking about the V uh, as it was being unrolled. And we got demonetized and shut down for a month, I believe, at one point after our third strike for talking about it, trying to get information out there. Um, but yeah, it's because YouTube's a centralized platform. It's very imperative that podcasting stays as a medium that's distributed via RSS feeds, which is an open protocol that anybody can, can pull from. And that is something Adam Curry, the inventor of podcasting hosted a no agenda show is very passionate about. Like we need to ensure that they do not go after podcasting via RSS feeds. Yeah, the, the whole censorship thing also has hit me since we talked last because I had Steve Malloy of Junk Science on my podcast. He said one sentence, the wrong sentence about the 2020 election. So they de just deleted that uh, episode. But interestingly, later they changed their policy and I was able to uh, successfully appeal and they put that one back up. But the, the worst one was uh, on my Google blog spot, I had this very long post about notes for climate skeptics had all this information about how here's what's happening with cyclones and hurricanes and crop yields, just all the straight up data. And Google just deleted that. They said it didn't meet their community standards. It's not that it wasn't, uh, it didn't have anything that I could see that would uh, violate anyone's standards. It was just a bunch of data. But they actually just deleted that one post, which I thought was kind of mind blowing. But now I moved it over to Substack. It seems like Substack is a place where you can still talk freely. So I'm doing more work there. I think that's why I originally reached out to you is that particular page. Um, oh, you had all this good data and it was like, oh. yeah, yeah, it's on Substack now. Cause a uh, blog spot won't, uh, they won't, uh, allow me to put that kind of thing up. That's not, <laughs> well, this is also, this is a signal that we're, that we're winning too, and that we should keep pushing forward all the censorship, deplatforming, demonetizing. Um, it is scary in the moment, but it should be looked at as a moral victory in a sense, because it, it does show that they are afraid of people like us discussing these problems and getting good information out to people. It's just typical actions of an empire on the decline, those in control, losing control and really trying to tighten their grip as they lose control. And we need to make sure that open source communication protocols like RSS and open source money like Bitcoin are preserved and strengthened throughout the next decade, because these are going to be, the last bastions of freedom and the places where we can congregate to actually have these conversations, get this information out to people. So another point I'd like to make is that uh, I, I find myself agreeing with people now that I'm shocked to find this list of people that I agree with, like Russell Brand. I, I never agreed with him. <laughs> and uh, Bill Maher. And who else? Oh, RFK Jr. I thought he was a nut. As of two years ago, I thought the guy, that guy's a nut. And now I've listened to tens of hours of his stuff and I'm finding him saying all sorts of sane stuff about lots of different things. So uh, Brett Weinstein, I, I don't think I agreed with him in the past. I think that's pretty healthy that uh, I, maybe we're coming together. Uh, we're, we're finding out what people really think. And one way to find out what we all really think is to listen at great length to what everybody is saying. And uh, I don't know how I would have found out in the past uh, w without the internet exactly what RFK Jr. thinks. Uh, somebody, I think Dave Collum was saying it's important to listen to what RFK actually says rather than uh, when people report on him and they tell you what he said. It's great that we can directly hear directly from his mouth what he's saying. Very important. Yeah. It's funny using RFK as an example earlier this summer when that video leaked of him at a dinner party talking about the potential. He was referencing a research paper that he read that said that the ACE2 inhibitor uh, and the spike protein and COVID um, as, as Connie Jews and particular, um, Chinese individuals were immune from that. And the, wow. the media just ran with it and tried to say that he was saying that like the Jews and the Chinese teamed up to put COVID on the world. And it was like, no, I didn't say that. I was just referencing 
a research paper that had this data in it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think they're going to try to smear him any way they can. But I really do, do hope that he gets on the debate stage, some debate stage this fall, because I think he does have a lot of things to say that a lot of people should hear. Yeah. And to your point, too, I mean, Rogan says this and has been saying this for probably over a decade now, but this format, just long form conversations, really digging into a subject, digging into an individual's perspective is way better than the two minute clips you get on Fox News, CNN. Like I remember going on Tucker, I went on Tucker after the trucker, um, the trucker uh, protest and when they're Coinbase wallets got frozen by the government. I went on to like explain it and it's a very nuanced topic that probably takes a couple hours to really dig into and understand. And I had two minutes to give it like a, a fucking, uh, a couple one liners about what was going on and what the, the reality of the situation was. Um, yeah. And I guess, did they have the chance to take out just the two minutes they wanted to, to uh, I mean, it was did they live. Cut out the, it was oh, live. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In a lot of cases, it's not live, right? And they'll just cut out the part that they want uh, people to know and cut out the good stuff. But yeah. Yeah. I think I got good information out there. But yeah, no, this is a better format where the, I don't know what, what's the, uh, the term they like to use? The, uh, the dark, what did they call? Like Rogan and uh, the Weinstein brothers. What do they call them, Logan? Uh, the what? intellectual dark web yeah the intellectual dark web <laughs> good propaganda uh phrase there but yeah the intellectual dark web yeah. uh, won't yeah. include us in that if we're not invited to the, the intellectual dark web parties but people <laughs> like them and like us getting this information out there is extremely important yeah. you mentioned adam curry i really i've been listening to his no agenda podcast for quite a while now i think you had him on your podcast the time or two but yeah i think it is, it's great to listen to those guys talk for hours about what they saw in the media and what they think about it it's uh, it's pretty fun deconstruction like i was listening it yeah. listen to it uh listening to it this morning finishing sunday's episode while i was making breakfast for the boys and uh it's just fun all they do is just play news clips and deconstruct it and that's the crazy thing when you aggregate um, all these news clips about a very particular subject, you begin to see that there probably are party lines that are distributed to people, like literal phrases that like dig into this, safe and effective, safe and effective, whatever it may be. Or build um, back better, right? There's videos of all politicians around the world saying build back better almost in unison. It's at the same time, out of yeah. nowhere. Then they had to change, and that, that's the thing, again, going back to we're winning, like you get those videos out there, those montages. Uh, what's the other one? This is dangerous for our democracy um, or something like that. Like you get those videos out there and it's very obvious. It's like, holy shit, this is insane that they're all saying it in unison at the same time. And it's like, oh, there's something going on here. And then they have to revert. They've changed Build Back Better to something else. Um, and they'll change ESG since it's happening in the ESG too. Like all, all the facts about how terrible it is are getting out there. Now Larry thinks like, well, I'm not going to say it anymore. And they're going to go back to the drawing board, get, get McKinsey in the, in the boardroom to come up with a better phrase. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're going to get less and less successful in pulling the wool over our eyes. I kind of think they are going to get licks. Maybe I'm not too optimistic, but I think as everybody has a chance now to talk about it at great length, that it's going to be tough for them to continue to just uh, to lie to us. I think it's harder to lie now. It's hard to lie. Yeah. And then building on what we were saying earlier, like the fact that you have your podcast, I have this podcast, Brett Weinstein, Rogan, whoever it may be. I'm a big believer in that too. Like say what you know to be true out loud to instill confidence in others to do the same. I think that's part of what we're witnessing too. Like you started your podcast after you came on the show last and you just added to that momentum as your example of an individual who is saying what you believe to be true that others would self-censor themselves from saying yes. publicly. And when you do that, you instill confidence in others to be like, I'm not crazy. I will say this as well. Yeah, I think there's uh, some safety in numbers and some snowballing and maybe even scientists now uh, in a climate world, they feel better about coming out and saying what they really think because more and more they're hearing other scientists saying that and they're thinking, well, maybe I can say what I think. They don't yeah, feel alone anymore. Yeah. Wasn't there a coalition of scientists who came out and signed a document saying we do not believe the climate narrative? Yeah, there's a, the Clintel, 
it's out of the uh, it's out of Europe somewhere. But yeah, the whole uh, hundreds or maybe sixteen hundred people signed that one, saying that there's basically no climate cri- crisis. So yeah, safety in numbers again, maybe. Yeah, we're gonna win, Tom. We're gonna win. You just got to keep showing yeah. up week in week out, talking about these subjects, instilling confidence in others. I don't want to blow too much smoke up our ass, but I truly do believe that. Um, it's just being consistent, showing up, having tough conversations, having the conversations they don't want you to have. And there are millions, potentially billions of people out there who sit there and self-censor deep down. They're like, I know this is bullshit, but I just can't say it. It's, it's politically unpalatable. Yeah. One thing that's making me happier and happier is being on either Twitter or comment sections on various articles and seeing how many, when people say crazy stuff in the main article about climate change, how many well-informed people will just come in there and say, this is wrong. This is why it's wrong. I'm seeing a lot more of that now than I was 10 years ago or even five years ago. There's just tons of people on Twitter. I, I don't know who they are, but uh, they're willing to take the time and to uh, like link to real data and say, this is baloney and here's why. I'm loving that. I think everybody can push back. No matter if you've got 10 followers on Twitter, you can still push back and make, make a difference. I think everybody should do that, both on social media and in real life. When people bring it up in your real life, I think all of us should just push back and say no, uh, rather than just uh, you know just to go along, just pretending it's true. I do it. Push back. Yeah, yeah. Push back, but mentally prepare to be labeled a Russian bot. Yeah, and think about how you're gonna you're gonna throw that back at them, um, because that's what yeah. they're gonna do. They're gonna 100. percent They're gonna do that, or you're a racist, or whatever, right? White no, supremacist. No matter what, they're gonna smear you. Yeah, but it's so important that I think we just got to do it. Just yeah. yeah, Tom, you're looking at somebody with blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm uh, a white supremacist just for existing. <laughs> 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 I yeah. guess, yeah. And again, that that is another example of how desperate they're getting. They're literally just like, "You're racist, you're bot." Yeah, yeah. It seems like they're really going after Alex Epstein in particular for some reason. That whatever they don't want to listen to any of his arguments. They just have to find some totally ridiculous thing. Uh, yeah, it's because well, he's effective. Yeah. That's why he's effective. Yeah, I think that is why. Yeah, his uh, energy talking points are. I feel like I go to that website once yeah. once a week just to make sure. I'm rebutting somebody. I'm like, no. Like, yeah. Yes. yeah. But he's a good model for the rest of us because he has the guts to go to a climate march with thousands of people and walk around interviewing people wearing an I love fossil fuels shirt. He's got, he actually did that. Uh, I, I think that his courage is great. I think more of us should have the courage to do that. I haven't done that yet, but maybe I should. Be courageous, freaks. Yeah. Like I said, there's a light switch. It's it's a, literally just a decision to say, stand up and say, I'm Spartacus. <laughs> like I, yeah, I believe this to be true. I'm not afraid to say it anymore. It's liberating too. It's a good yeah. feeling. You're actually living true to what you believe and who you are. You may be wrong on some things, but you can't fault yourself for believing particular things and voicing those beliefs. Maybe you interact with, you put them out there, then you have a conversation. Maybe your beliefs change, but if you don't put them out there, you don't have the opportunity to battle test them. Um, and I know there's, Many of you listening to this sitting in cubes across the world, working jobs that you don't like just to get by in this fiat world. If you were to voice some of these concerns that you have with how our society is going, the trajectory it's going in, I think you would be surprised at the impact that could have in shifting that trajectory towards a, a more beneficial future. Yeah, and I think in this particular case, in the case of the climate scam in particular, the stakes are so high that it really is worth it to speak out because it's not just some little thing that doesn't really matter about uh, whatever. Um, it's not a tiny issue. It's just a huge issue. So it's, no, it's worth it to stick your neck out for a huge issue. Yeah. No, and I think timing is of the essence, particularly with climate, because when you like energy is the most important thing. Again, we mentioned that earlier, but like yeah. getting to the point where the incentives to go into the fossil fuel industry, to go into the nuclear industry are are being like people are being disincentivized to do that. We're literally probably less than a generation away from an intellectual capital standpoint, from literally forgetting how to maintain and operate yeah. all these systemically important energy yeah. infrastructure that, that was built over the course of centuries. Absolutely. Uh, so for some reason that made me think of a quote from Martin Durkin, uh, 
about how you'll never wake up early on a Saturday morning. Or, let's see. You might wake up early on a Saturday morning desperately needing a plumber, but you'll never wake up early on a Saturday morning desperately needing a sociologist. It's <laughs> uh, a great quote. Uh, because uh, it, it just brings to light how important real work is and how, uh, you know, how this, uh, the work, the alleged work done by the elites is not really that important. So. Yeah. It goes back to fiat. Yeah. You print money, subsidize all the social sociology degrees, uh, lawyers, what else? Financial people in finance, just creating financial products to make money on fake money and fake derivatives. And you completely, again, disincentivize people from going to learn how to do the hard work that actually makes life possible today. Uh, and we could wake up yeah. at some point in the future and be like, I don't need the sociologist. I need the chemical engineer who actually knows how to go uh, drill uh, a vertical well or a, a fracking well to get oil to market so I can turn my goddamn lights on. Like. Yeah, so Durkin calls these uh, people the new class, and I think he's going to write a book about the new class, where it's a, a class of people where they want to just control the little people, and they want to live off of tax money, they don't want to produce real work, and they kind of think people who do the real work are a kind of uh, kind of little people that we shouldn't really care about. And we really have to fight against this new class, and we really have to elevate the people who are actually doing the work to feed us and to move us around. And it, I think it's really important anyway to defend the working people and to be on the side of the working people, not this new class that's kind of parasitic on the working people. Yeah, the new class is disgusting. It's not, yeah. not what you should teach your kids to strive for. And what is one thing you can do? And we've talked about on this show in the past, go shake a rancher's hand. Start with a rancher. Start yeah. with the food. Go buy a steak. Go buy some eggs. Go buy chicken, some bacon, whatever it may be. Just drive past your grocery store into the rural area. Find a farmer. Shake his hand and say, hey, how do you make your food? And how can I help your business so that you can keep making food so that I can eat? Actually, good stuff that is not industrial sludge. Yeah. My wife and I just did that for the first time. We bought one eighth of a cow from an actual farmer. And I think uh, we've got to do a lot more of that. Uh, I'm liking that idea. And I don't know if uh, the new class is going to try to block us, prevent us from being able to do that. I don't know. Hope not. Well, if, you're, if your cow's not mass and it's burping methane into the atmosphere, we're going to have to shut, right. down, shut down your ranch. I'm sorry. I'm farting too much. That's right. I think John Kerry has said some things about uh, we got to do something about farmers because they're causing these problems. John Kerry has a lot of gall to talk about causing problems. Um, right. And these people need, that's another thing I strongly believe too. We just need to ridicule these people. Like the clown yes. world meme has been very effective. Um, obviously Biden being uh, a living Roomba vacuum that has no idea where he's going at any given point in time is easy to make fun of uh, the just stop oil people who look like they are petulant children that are that parasitic class preventing the productive class from literally getting work to do what they getting to work to do what they need to do. Like it's very easy to mock these people. And again, you should have the courage to mock them. They deserve to be mocked and uh, you can actually make the argument. You have a duty to mock them to make sure that they don't ruin this world for the rest of us. Yeah. A duty to mock them and it may be a duty to support farmers and be on the side of farmers. Like I think in the Netherlands, there's a push to get rid of 20% of the farms yeah, they want to put in 15-minute cities. Yeah, I, I've heard that there's been some electoral success where the farmers are getting some backing at the, uh, at the voting booth over there. I don't know if that's true or not, or if you've heard much about that, but I think uh, I plan to vote in favor of farmers anytime I can, that's for sure. Yeah, and particularly in the Netherlands, right? We're talking about some of the oldest farms in the world. You're talking about- Very productive farms, yeah. Yeah, very productive, and they go back- like many generations, like the mid 15th century, I'm pretty sure a lot of them do. It's yeah. world economic forms coming in and saying, no, your cows are farting too much. We need to take your land. We're going to put up 15 minute cities and here's your CBDC wallet and your electric car that can only travel 10 minutes from your house. Enjoy it. By the way, I just can't believe that they're trying to sell this idea to Joe public that cow farts cause hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they ever expected that to go over, but I think that's kind of a, every time they use that argument, I think that's a point for us on, on the realist side. Cause Wait, when you put it that way, cow farts cause hurricanes. It is pretty comical and yeah. easy to laugh at. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. So. Tom, 
it was too long between our first episode and our second episode. That's not, uh, Absolutely. let's not wait this long between now and the next episode. That sounds great. And then you're going to be on my podcast coming up, right? So we got that coming up. Yeah. And I'm thinking about putting together a presentation. Um, I saw your Ooh, I email. I love that. Last totally week. love that. I think we can talk about Bitcoin mining and energy. That um, sounds great. And focus yeah. on a solution instead yeah. of, instead of talking about these people creating the problems. Yeah. My audience just, as I said, I, they love presentations. So I like them too. So yeah, I'd love to hear that. All right. See it. I'm going to put one together. Okay. You enjoy this Bitcoin white paper day, 15th anniversary of the white paper being released on the earth. We're going to win. We're going to win because people we like are. you and others out and there you. who had the courage to speak up against the madness. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Peace and love freaks. The key.